look at Swissborg. 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 Swissborg est sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the markets. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features give you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, co-founder and CEO of The Tie, Joshua Frank. And we're going to give you guys access to the biggest facts, the best data sets in terms of understanding the price and the popularity of Bitcoin, crypto assets as a whole, but also the BS indicators and signals that we believe are true but are not all of this is going to be data-driven, data porn today for crypto. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Nate and the entire team at Crypto Slate, our partners that always create awesome articles and summaries of these videos. So don't forget to check out their website. It's awesome content. And without further ado, thank you so much, Joshua Frank from The Tie for coming on today. How are you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me. Shouts to Nate Whitehill. He's the absolute champ. He's the man. Nate is definitely the champ, guys. And definitely don't forget to check out Crypto Slate. They have some really high quality content. And talking about high quality content, we're going to get access to high quality data and metrics today. But before kicking off, Joshua, could you tell us a little bit about what you do and, and why it matters to you in this crypto space? Sure. Yeah. I run a, uh, a company called The Tie. We're a leading provider of data uh, to different types of enterprise in this space. So we work with everybody from uh, institutions, both quantitative and discretionary to uh, token issuers, to publications, to researchers, to law firms. Really what we do is we help our clients, you know, both track market moving events in real time so they can action on those events, but also contextualize what actually moves the prices of cryptocurrencies. A lot of times our, question, our, our clients will come to us and they'll say, hey, you know, we see that X coin spiked by 36% today. You know, what confluence of factors existed that, that led to that price movement? So we started in this space. Um, with with quantified sentiment data. So we're one of four financial data companies globally that has access to the Twitter Firehose, which is the full stream, uh, real-time stream directly from Twitter of a billion tweets a day. Uh, and we brought that technology over from traditional asset classes uh, where we were serving quantified equities, you know, futures, forex, fixed income data to some of the largest traditional quantitative hedge funds. And we realized is, hey, if you can use sentiment data, and, and for anybody who doesn't know, sentiment data is really a measurement of how positive or negative investors are about a particular asset at a given point in time. So if you can use measurements of how positive investors are about a particular asset to predict the price of, for example, Apple stock, where Apple has real earnings and revenue and dividends, like Apple has fundamentals, there's a company there. Well, in the crypto space where there's no fundamentals, right, the largest thing is sentiment or one of the largest things is sentiment. And and, and the idea that in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king, right? If you can see a little bit into this market, that's a whole lot more than anybody else. And so that's how we got started, uh, started in the market. We started with sentiment data. But as we got deeper and deeper into this market, we realized that nobody had any way of staying on top of important, critical market moving news and information. So in the equity world, right, you can log into, you know, for anybody who knows and, and, and you know, I, I think most people will, but you can log into your Bloomberg terminal, your icon, facts at even Yahoo Finance. And if you want to figure out every time Apple had a stock buyback, a stock split, a dividend, if you want to see Apple's earnings, you just Google Apple's earnings, right? If you want to see other earnings call, you just you just Google that. But within crypto, that's just it's it was it was incredibly difficult to stay on top of all that information because not only is the market, you know, quote unquote decentralized, which is, you know, may or may not be true, it's mostly just disorganized. So trying to stay on top of the most critical market moving information was almost impossible. So we built technology that goes out to thousands and thousands of sources and basically scrapes or pulls information from those sources in real time. And so we're pulling from primary sources 
So we'll pull in everything into our database from micro strategies, investor relations section of their website to look to see if they're buying more Bitcoin to the NYDFS to see if people like PayPal are receiving bit licenses to every single SEC filing. So the second somebody announces a new crypto fund or the second that Coinbase announces their S1 for IPO, we'll pick up that information to regulatory rollings, news in China, exchange listings in Japanese. I mean, you name it. We're pulling in that information and we service that information to the largest publications who are then going out and writing, you know, stories on the most critical market moving news to hedge funds that want to trade off that information to law firms and regulators that want to, you know, pay attention and stay, stay abreast to, you know, the, the most, you know, kind of, you know, critical and, and salient developments in the space. That sounds really, really good. And as you mentioned, in terms of fundamentals, you know, in traditional finance, when looking at stock markets, we have PE ratios, we have stock formulas, we have wallet data, we have fix, fixed income and yield concepts. There, there are so many data points that actually matter when trying to value something. How do you value the crypto assets when you don't have all this data? Is the sentiment data the most relevant and the most uh, and the best in terms of predictions? So I actually have a podcast, which anybody can check out as well. It's called the Fundamental Value Podcast. And it's literally the entire concept of the podcast is we bring on hedge fund managers to discuss how you value Bitcoin because it's and, and how you value crypto because it, it varies differently. So I'm going to give you a couple different schools of thought here um, on how you could potentially value Bitcoin and, and, and other cryptocurrencies. My personal opinion is that there are no fundamentals, by the way. Uh, and that there's no real way to value these assets. And and fundamentals only exist because people agree upon them, right? Just like PE ratios are kind of garbage now because nobody really agrees upon anything and the stock market is kind of just decided to, to have a mind of its own. The same thing kind of goes in crypto. Like there's not there's nothing that's widely agreed upon. I mean, Chris Berniski wrote a great book called Crypto Assets where he proposes a lot of different, uh, a lot of different, you know, I ideas behind it. Um, I mean, there's, you know, within DeFi, for example, some of these product products have introduced yields. Uh, some of these products have introduced fee structures, governance, you know, governance rewards, and different things like that, which are certainly interesting. Um, you know, there's the whole argument of with with Ethereum and other protocols of, of the protocol versus application argument, right? Like, you know, if for example, if Chainlink does well, does that mean that Ethereum should do well uh, because Chainlink is built on top of Ethereum? Um, and there, there are varying schools of thoughts there, right? So I, I don't think there's one set of fundamentals. I mean, I think it really depends on the protocol level uh, or it depends on the type of, of asset that it is, right? If it's, if it's a currency like Bitcoin, right? I mean, the fundamentals of Bitcoin are supply and demand, right? And, and sentiment. If it's something like, you know, if it's, if it's something like Uniswap, potentially there's some different fundamentals because, you know, token token you know holders can receive some sort of rewards. If there's some sort of governance and voting rights, you know, there there's some fundamentals there. Um, but th broadly speaking, there are no widely accepted fundamentals for crypto, uh, and I think it's sorely misguided to think that there are because if we asked your comment section, every single person would have a different answer, and if everyone has a different answer, nobody can be right. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I guess it's really how we define fundamental analysis, right? So everyone has their own definition of these things and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what are some of the data sets that really mean a lot to you in terms of predicting a potential bull run? Obviously, I'm sure things change a lot, but if you had to list, let's say the top three or give a few examples on what you think really matters, that would be awesome, Joshua. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's a few different types. I'll, I'll go over all the types of data sets in crypto because there aren't that many. The first is sentiment. The second is on-chain data, right? And, and on-chain data is big. It can be split into a lot of things, but it's looking at how many active addresses there are on a blockchain. It can be th like things like mempool transactions. It can be flows onto and off of exchange. It can be, you know, concentration among, you know, you know, wallet holders who have held for a certain period of time. There's a lot you can do with on-chain data. You have market data. So actually looking at things like order book, book depth, you can look at, you know, look different measures of liquidity. You can look at different measures of market manipulation, right? You have uh, news data and, and what we call SIG dev data, which is looking at kind of the most salient and important significant developments in the space, which is, you know, everything from exchange listings to partnerships and announcements, staking, uh, regulatory rollings, et cetera. Um, you have GitHub activity tracking, uh, which is looking at things like how active the development are for these pro projects. Um, but I, I, that's, unless I'm missing something, that's really it. There aren't that many, you know, and sure, maybe you have for Bitcoin, some more macro factors, right? That you can look at, for example, like, you know, the inflation rate in different, different countries and new, you know, dollar issuance. 
But broadly speaking, there aren't that many alternative data sets for crypto that that exist yet or that can exist. Like if you're looking at the stock market, right, and you're trying to predict whether or not Home Depot's stock can go up, you can look at meteorological patterns to see if there's a higher probability of a hurricane. And if there is, there may be, you know, some more demand for Home Depot building materials. You can put up a satellite and you can look at how many cars are going into and out of the Home Depot parking lot, right? Like there's so many different types of alternative data sets that you can use in traditional assets that aren't really at least yet applicable to crypto. Though, I mean, some of them can be. So for example, you could look at meteorological patterns to see if miners in China are going to get impacted and what type of impact that would have have on you know the, the the supply of Bitcoin or not the supply, but at least you know the hash rate on Bitcoin, right? Like there's certain things that you can look at, but nobody's looking at that data yet, or nobody is publicly looking at any of that data yet. So, in terms of what I think is the most critical, so unlike a lot of others in the space, there are lots of you know quote unquote fundamental funds and value driven investors and things like that. We don't deal with any of that. So our clients are trying to figure out where the price of crypto is going in the next five minutes, in the next minute, in the next 30 seconds, the next hour, in the next 24 hours, you know, up to maybe a maximum of 30 days. We don't solve for where is Bitcoin going in 2027. Um, that's just not the type of client base that we solve for. So in terms of short term price movements, I can actually share my screen and show some research that we've done with uh, with eToro on this. But really, what are the you know most critical uh, news developments and how do they relate to price? So hold up. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. That's a great report, by the way. We'll put a link in the description box below, guys. So you can get access to it. It's great metrics. Very interesting information coming out of that research. So yeah, so here are different news developments, uh, or we, what we call significant developments. And this is the uh, average price impact on the upside over 24 hours. So we see that staking announcements, listing announcements, partnership announcements uh, tend to have the biggest positive impact on price. But it's not enough just to look at, hey, you know, how much of a positive impact do these specific events have on price? But you also want to understand is how sustainable those particular events are. So what we're looking at is we've created something called a sustainability level. And what we've seen is that mergers and acquisitions, for example, FTX's acquisition of Blockfolio tends to be the most sustainable type of event. Um, and you can see, you know, here is what an average m and event looks like. And you can see, you know, after launch, it goes up. It may fall a little bit, but it continues to go up after time versus something like a partnership where it has this very quick upward spike and this very quick dip. And just because something doesn't necessarily stay up for a long period of time doesn't mean it's not a really exciting data point. If you can understand, you can quantify what the average partnership, what the average, you know, listing what the average airdrop looks like, well, then you can trade off of it both on the upside and on the downside, right? If you can time when the thing's going up, when the thing's going down, and the corresponding volatility surrounding it, that's really interesting. But to us, it wasn't enough to just look at, you know, because news doesn't exist on its own, right? What happens is you have news that drops, and then sentiment is the response to news, right? It's how investors are responding to particular pieces of information. And, you know, there's so much more in this report that, you know, we can go into if you want, but I think everybody can just Google it. But one of the more interesting things that we found was that for certain data points, there was an exponential relationship between sentiment and price change corresponding with a specific event. So for example, with exchange listings, people may have seen you know Coinbase listings and Binance listings generating tremendous returns. But mm -hmm. what we found is there's actually an exponential relationship between sentiment after the listing and price change. So if there's a listing that occurs and sentiment is is super high, so about two standard deviations from the mean, we just converted it to zero to one hundred to make it simpler for users. Um, the 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 price impact is exponential, and so what we're really focused on is kind of this relationship between you know the most critical news developments, uh, sentiment and price impact. We're, you know we're certainly looking at other data points as well, but for us in a market that's void of fundamentals you know, sentiment and critical real-time market moving information like regulatory rulings, SEC filings, court cases, and 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 sentiment uh, are, you know, are the two most critical data points in the market. That's fascinating. Well, it just confirms, you know, the listing kind of bullishness that it has. And so just to clarify in terms of actual bull trends, the merger and acquisitions will always outperform the partnerships. Is that correct? No, no, you can't. You can't say anything will always. So I, always, I always will. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always will refrain from saying that. So yeah. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, 
this is what we've seen in the past and past results are not necessarily an indication of what will happen yeah. in the future, but I, we have future, a data, yeah. data set of about 10,000 data points here. And what we've seen is broadly speaking, after a week, mergers and acquisitions have the largest, pos most positive impact uh, on price. So the average M&A activity in crypto we've seen is at an 8.23% positive impact on the underlying asset. Funding uh, is at about a 4.2%. Um, you know, employment changes for whatever reason, uh, if it's a big employment change, has had an impact. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, s certain things make sense. For example, 51% yeah, attacks yeah, uh, have the most negative impact. And there's only a 21% uh, chance that the price of an asset will go up within... Uh, a week after 51% attacks. Uh, something interesting is that we've seen 100% of the time that token burns uh, have had a positive impact on price after a day, but only 50% after a week, which just shows how unsustainable they are. Uh, but but quite interesting, right? Because for anybody listening who doesn't know, a token burn is basically, uh, it's, it's a deflationary event. It's when you're reducing the supply of a token, right? So, you know, with an asset, maybe there's a supply of 20 million, the foundation is saying, hey, we're going to remove $2 million of that supply. So hypothetically, in that case, that's a 10% removal, and you'd think the price should go up corresponding to that removal of 10% of supply. To this point, we haven't seen that happen, but we have seen short-term you know, net positive impacts. I mean, it will be interesting to see how that, you know, how that changes over time. That makes a lot of sense because it's not because you're decreasing the supply that you're increasing the demand, right? So it's kind of like the plan B scenario where you know, people talk about, yes, the, the supply is fixed, uh, but still, the demand needs to go up in order to actually have positive uh, effect on the price itself, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's so many, there's so many factors. Supply in Bitcoin isn't even as fixed as people think it is. People think there's this fixed supply curve for Bitcoin, which is true. The new issuance of supply is fixed. But what people fail to talk about is also the deflationary aspect of people forgetting their keys. Like nobody talks mm -hmm. about that. Like. There are estimates that 5 million Bitcoin are lost forever. You know, 3 to 5 million Bitcoin are lost forever because people just forgot their keys. I'm sure you have listeners that have forgotten their keys to their Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think Bitcoin is actually going to be a deflationary asset, not an inflationary asset going forward. Do you agree that uh, Bitcoin could reach the six digits or is it just still too far since you like sure. to focus Bitcoin on... Bitcoin could reach nine digits. It could reach 10 digits. It could reach 11 digits. So could gold, right? Like I think, I think trying to predict that far out to the future is just futile and it's ridiculous and it ignores so many different things that can happen in the market it ignores the concentration of mining power in china it ignores the fact that governments could shut down mining you know in the west because it's very energy intensive right and then all of a sudden there's additional mining concentration in china right like there's so many factors that that ignores i think it's ridiculous to try to predict where the price is going to go I'm bullish on Bitcoin. I hold a very large percentage of my net worth in Bitcoin. I run a crypto company, right? I'm obviously bullish, but I think that trying to come up with some sort of model to predict the price, even though that gets retail users really excited about it, right? And it drives some, you know, potentially increased demand. I think it's ridiculous and I think it's completely misleading. That's a really good point. And also when we talked about the data sets, like the other day, uh, Joshua, you told me also that TAM is also BS in terms of indicators. And since we're talking about a lot of BS indicators, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's I think I think TAM generally is really is is really dumb, right? You know, it's it's like saying, for example, you know, the global meat industry is worth, you know, whatever trillions of dollars a year. So therefore beyond meat can be worth that many trillions of dollars a year. That's just not the case, right? Like I think just looking at saying, oh, what if we captured X? is is just a bad way to quant I mean you know you could go into a, to a VC's office right and you could say oh well you know the search engine industry is worth you know you know Google does a trillion dollars a year and, and hypothetically we could capture that well we all know that Google has you know 90 whatever percent market share right and you're not capturing that right so I think just looking at TAM is 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 very misleading very nicely put. And I'd love to ask you a follow-up question based on sentiment data, if we can zoom into that, since that's something that you're using effectively with the tie. And I'd love to know, Joshua, like in terms of sentiment data, is most of it coming through, obviously you talked about the wallet addresses, uh, moving moving actual circulating supply and, and the moving of the assets, but is Twitter like the main feed when it comes to sentiment data? What are some of the, the data sets that you really, really like when looking at crypto? We, and we focus on Twitter. The sample size on Twitter is massive, so we're focused exclusively on Twitter. We have other data sets in our, in you know, we, we're, we're pulling in information from 2,000 different data sets, but with sentiment, we focus exclusively on Twitter. 
Uh, the reason being is it's just it, it is the center of crypto Twitter. I mean, the center crypto Twitter is a center of the crypto universe. Right. And there's just, you know, there's so many conversations uh, and we, we, we find that there there are stati- statistically significant data on about 100 more than 100 currencies are having enough conversation on a daily basis on Twitter to, to be statistically significant. Um, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, we see 30,000 tweets a day. And that's a really large sample size for trying to understand and quantify where investors are at. But the biggest thing for your audience to know is that positive sentiment doesn't necessarily mean positive price movement. So the, a lot of the customers that we service are, are, are quantitative hedge funds that will be taking in four or five different data sets. And they'll be you know building models to predict movement on those data sets. So for example, from a longer term point of view, what's quite interesting is, is that we found that positive sentiment and positive uh, po- and, and positive increases in Twitter activity actually tend to be an indicator of decreased price movement over the next 30 days, contrary to what you'd think, because it tends to mean that the value of the signal is evaporated. Whereas on the other hand, when we've seen positive, you know, positive sentiment and low tweet volume or high tweet volume and low sentiment, right? A lot of people are, po- or, or, you know, the people that are talking are super positive, but there's few people talking that tends to be indicative. And when there's, you know, a lot of people talking, but they're negative, it's kind of the idea of, hey, no news is bad news, right? Um, and so it, we're really studying the interactions and interrelationships between all these different metrics because we don't think that any metric on its own, um, you know, is is indicative, right? I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a confluence of different, different metrics. But I will say on, to that point that specific news and specific developments on their own can have a massive price impact. For example, if something gets listed on Coinbase, it wasn't on Coinbase before, it's going to go up within the next five minutes, right? So, you know, with, with news developments, you know, they can impact the market, you know, regardless of market conditions. Um, but, but even market conditions have an impact on development. So for example, you'll see during a bear market, there's significantly fewer listings because exchanges know that, Hey, if I list an asset now, it's not going to run up the way that it did in the past. Right. So there's just so many factors at play here that there's just not one that you can use to constantly say, Hey, if this happens, that's going to happen. The only, you know, the only other thing that I would add to that, um, is, is, if you see the number of people talking about NASA continually go up over time, that tends to be a really good predictor of price movement. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is, you know, the reason Bitcoin is so successful isn't because of the fundamental technology of Bitcoin. I mean, you know, you know that there's, you know, Bitcoin was built by Satoshi 12 years ago or 13 years ago, right? It's not the most, it's not the best technology that we have in the crypto, crypto space. I'm sure there are 30 protocols that, that, that have better tech or more than that, that have better technology than Bitcoin. The reason Bitcoin is successful is because of its community, right? It's because so many people believe in Bitcoin. I mean, you asked about fundamentals. The fundamentals of Bitcoin is community, right? And the reason that Ethereum has done so much better than EOS and other chains, well, certainly maybe Ethereum has better tech, but it's also community, right? It's because more people are talking about it and more people are building on it, right? Ethereum has ETH Denver, where you have thousands of developers congregating to build on top of Ethereum, Right. And so, you know, in, in terms of sentiment data, the one thing that I'll look at from a longer period of time isn't even just how positive or negative investors are. It's just are more people talking about this thing, because broadly speaking, like if you look at Chainlink, for example, you know, you had that we've seen these giant spikes, in the number of people talking about Chainlink. And we were tweeting about this in 2018, way before there was any sort of price movement around Chainlink. Um, you know, if, if you have a community, if you have people that believe in something, you know, that, that is the most important thing in crypto and also not getting hacked and not getting <laughs> hacked. Yeah. That's so beautiful. You know, what I really love about your data sets, Joshua, is the fact that you're really creating and breaking some of the misconceived beliefs that we have, you know, or preconceived beliefs that we have related to crypto. And it's very good to see which data sets actually work, which don't, which are short term, which are long term. It's fascinating. Um, and I'd like to move on to another topic, uh, probably the last theme for today, which is uh, the DeFi movement. And obviously, you know, there have been many crypto bubbles in the space. We saw many of the DeFi assets and, and tokens just plummeting all the way down to 90%. Uh, what is your overall view? Obviously, you can see data that we cannot see. Uh, what is the, the data telling you in terms of the DeFi story? We talked about the beautiful Bitcoin narrative, which built the community, the Ethereum narrative, which built the community. What about the DeFi narrative? Yeah, I mean, to me, DeFi, you know, reminds me of a lot of things that we've seen in crypto before, right? With with crypto, I'm 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 
bullish on this digital gold narrative actually holding weight and holding value and existing for a long period of time. But with crypto, crypto has just been so narrative driven. And we've had these very short term narratives throughout its history. Like Bitcoin was going to be used as a digital cash, right? It wasn't originally a digital gold, right? And Roger Vera was going and running around to every single retailer trying to tell them to accept Bitcoin as a digital cash, right? And we quickly found out that Bitcoin doesn't work as a digital cash because the network's not scalable enough to handle that amount of transactions, uh, right? And then all of a sudden we had the ICO boom, right? And utility tokens were the job biggest thing and everybody wanted to put their money in a fucking Chuck E. Cheese token, right? Like, you know, it was like you had all this, you had all these garbage tokens just like, I mean, you know, my favorite one, I use this example a lot, is DentaCoin. I still don't know what DentaCoin is. It was some dental token. It was worth like... Two billion dollars, or something stupid like that. Like a, a, a cryptocurrency for dentists was worth like two or four or whatever stupid amount of money, right? And you just had, you've had, we had so many of these utility tokens, and you could just go go to Coin Market Cap, go try to search for something that launched in 2017, and just look at the price chart. Chances are it's down 98, 99 percent now, right? So you know we had this ICO bubble and boom, and that led to this massive run in Ethereum because all of a sudden every ICO took Ethereum. And so we kind of had this Ethereum bubble that happened where Ethereum ran up to over $1,000 because everybody was rushing to get Ethereum to throw it into ICOs. Then ICOs crashed. Then we had this IEO bubble. And I don't know if you remember, it was like a month. IEOs were like the absolute biggest thing. Then it turns out that none of those IEOs did any did well at all, um, right? And then we had we had an earlier NFT you know, kind of boom where everybody was super excited about NFTs. We had, you know, NFT conferences and all these things. And, you know, Crypto Kitties took up the entire, you know, the entire Ethereum network. And there were Crypto Kitties selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now Crypto Kitties are not selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, we've just had we've had these waves of things. And and look, it, it seems like DeFi has some more sustainability than, than some of these other solutions. It seems like there's some really interesting developments in DeFi, like the idea of automated market makers seems to me to be, you know, pretty interesting. Um, you know, there are other developments uh, in DeFi, which I find to be interesting. But there's also just the notion of, hey, this reminds me a lot of things that we've seen in the past. And I think people are just not quantifying the risks of these platforms. I mean, we saw... Just the other day, we had five DeFi hacks in Q1, and we just saw the other day another DeFi hack of some protocol that I've never heard of before, um, That, but it listed on Binance, you know, three weeks ago, and then it got hacked for $2 million, right? And so, you know, I think we're early. Uh, we haven't seen any mainstream, you know, use cases of, of, of DeFi. I mean, I think Uniswap is pretty interesting, especially if you're trying to get exposure to, to specific assets just because of how many assets they list. Uh, I think it's just early. I think we're really early. We haven't seen any sort of mainstream enthusiasm. And if you look at you know the number of wallet addresses that are interacting with these with these decentralized protocols, they tend to be it tends to be a very small number. I mean, if you look at like you know DYDX, they have like 500 users, right? And and so you have to just look at you know how many people are actually interacting with these applications as well, because we're we are really early. And I think it's more of a you know hey wait and see. And if we're talking about where institutional capital is going into, it's not going into DeFi, right? You know, the big institutions that are coming into the space, that money is going into Bitcoin and potentially Ethereum. It's not going into these DeFi, you know, applications at this point. Thank you so much for sharing that and talking about all the different waves. And speaking of waves, I'd love to ask you, Joshua, what is the next wave, you know, for 2021, possibly 2022? Some of the people say that DeFi is going to fade out slowly and then all of a sudden proof of stake is going to be the biggest concept of next year. What do you think can be the biggest hype of 2021 if you see it, of course? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the unfortunate thing about my answers is I like to dispel shit instead of giving my own opinion. Uh, so, so look, I will say I think the the I'm I'm looking out for institutions. That's it. That's my sole focus is where institutions are coming, what they're doing, and how retail responds to that. Right. I'm really interested in seeing how institutions are allocating this space. I'm interested in seeing you know, um, you know how different enterprises are interacting with crypto. Um, you know, that the, the, the whole thing about Square and MicroStrategy's treasury is super interesting to me. Do I think other companies' treasuries will do it? I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know. Do, do company treasuries hold gold? Like, I don't know. Do they? Probably not that many. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that it happened twice. Will it happen another time? I think so. But, you know, how many times will it happen? That's an interesting thing to monitor, right? You know, I know a lot of crypto companies will do it. And look, maybe we'll virtue signal and put 
you know, 20% of our treasury in Bitcoin because we think it's going to go up. But it's just virtue signaling, right? It's not like, it's not like, you know, it's, I mean, you know, we'll see, right? I mean, a lot of crypto companies are already holding it, but I'm really interested in seeing like, will pensions flow into the space? Yeah, right? yeah Because exactly. pensions are, that's where the real capital is, right? And do we build up enough liquidity to support pensions? Um, you know, where does institutional trading go in this space? You know, is it does it continue to be crypto funds that are dominating? And I think it's a lot less so. You know, you see a lot of the the you know the prop shops in Chicago and, and quant funds, uh, you know, now moving into the space where they've already quietly been in the space for quite some time, right? It'll be interesting to see who's actually trading crypto. Um, you know, I'm really interesting to see what you know Fidelity is doing. I think they're a really great barometer on institutional interest because, you know, if you're a family office that already has an account with Fidelity, you know, I don't think you're going to go to, you know, FTX or Binance to create your first account to trade Bitcoin, right? I think you're more likely to go to Fidelity or to custody with somebody like State Street who have tested crypto custody, right? So I'm interested in seeing how those those folks are doing. Um, you know, uh, You know, I think Fidelity is a great and very interesting example. I mean, they're they're hiring twenty more employees for for Fidelity Digital Assets, which is incredibly bullish. Um, so I'm 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 looking at institutional adoption, right? I'm looking for more Stanley Druck and Millers to come out. I'm looking for you know crypto funds to put out a press release that says you know hey you know you know Omer is invested in us or you know this other pension invested in us, right? Like that's. That's what I'm interested yeah, in monitoring. Interesting. That's what I'm interested in watching. And then, you know, do we see that retail euphoria come back that existed a few years ago? Once um, we hit over twenty thousand, right, we'll probably see some interest. I, again. I think it's. I think it's going to be a number game, right? Yeah, I think it's. it's a number game. I think it's because because it, because the retail euphoria will come. You know, I think as the mainstream media starts to talk about Bitcoin more, and we have data on that, and we've started to see it pick up a bit more and more as we've gotten closer uh, and closer. I think once we get to eighteen and then nineteen thousand dollars. That's when you start seeing, I mean, I don't know if you remember in 2017, Bitcoin ticker was on CNBC yeah, all day all long, day long. <laughs> right? All day long, right? When that comes back, that's when the euphoria comes back, yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, when your grandma starts texting you about Bitcoin again, right? Or 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 your or your mom or your, your friend from high school you haven't talked to in 10 years who's like, oh, I know that you like Bitcoin and crypto. That's that's what I'm looking out for. That's, that's really what I'm excited about seeing. And I think you brought up a really critical point there, Josh. Because talking about institutional adoption, you talked about corporate treasury and government treasury, pension funds. You know, even more than Drucken Miller, even more than Paul Tudor Jones. Does it even matter more that the fact that a government or, for example, the U.S. Treasury actually allocates funds towards Bitcoin? Is that the final stamp of approval really showing that, OK, this is not just an investor. This is not just a company. This is an entire country that believes in the future of this asset. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen that with some, you know, you know, not really advanced countries. Yeah, yeah, Iran, uh, Iran. Uh, they're they're allocating their their assets to Bitcoin already. And I yeah. think Venezuela is in Venezuela holding yeah. Bitcoin as well, and North Korea. I mean, you know, look, I wouldn't call those advanced. You know, well, Iran is an advanced economy, kind of, but but I, I'm not looking for the U.S. government stamp of approval on Bitcoin. You know, I don't care that the U.S. government. Look, I care that the U.S. government doesn't regulate the hell out of it, right? And 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 you know, and shut down the fiat on ramps, things like that. And I'm. Not as concerned about that as I was in the past. Um, you know, we're, we're super lucky to have Hester Pierce and some awesome, you know, other other, you know, advocates for crypto in the U.S. government. Um, you know, you know, Kelly Loeffler has done some other, you know, you know, she had some insider trading and some other things, which, you know, but she is a Bitcoin advocate and she's running in Georgia. Um, you know, we saw another Bitcoin advocate get elected to the Senate in Wyoming. Um, so, yeah, look, I think, you know, I think. If we start to get more regulatory clarity out of regulators, like if the SEC approves a Bitcoin ETF, to me, that's way more. Well, if the U.S. Treasury holds Bitcoin, obviously, that's so freaking bullish. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But if the SEC approves a Bitcoin ETF or something like that, that's enough signaling for me. I mean, that's going to just I mean, that would just be so massive. Too if big retail to fail, investors. Huh? Well, if retail investors can buy Bitcoin and hold it in their retirement account without paying a 17% premium to access GBTC from Grayscale, right? You know, and and, and you can log into Fidelity.com or Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade or E-Trade and just buy Bitcoin directly in your retirement account. 
um, you know, through an ETF where you don't have to custody the asset. It's easier to gain exposure. A retail user doesn't need to understand not your keys, not your coins, because, you know, for all you crypto advocates there that believe that, and, and you know, certainly I do too, that's not how the mainstream is going to adopt Bitcoin, right? So I think just, I think these, these you know, like an ETF would be super freaking bullish. That's what I'm looking out for. And also just, just looking at institutional flows into Bitcoin, right? Looking at, you know, you know, just just big name companies, right? What are big name companies doing? Like, like does does you know J.P. Morgan Chase is now banking you know Coinbase and a few others, but they're not banking small crypto companies. Like you know if if you know you know small crypto companies that accept payments in crypto, you know ourselves included, you know in some cases need to have multiple bank accounts just to accept crypto, right? Like we can't bring it to Chase because we're worried that Chase will shut down our bank account, right? Like if if these more mainstream companies aren't doing that. You know, I think that's 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 going to be highly bullish for crypto as well. There you go, dear community. Hope you enjoyed today's session. We talked about all the data sets, the signals, the indicators and the facts about what actually matters when looking at Bitcoin and crypto assets. Let us know if you have found some interesting data sets or points that make sense to you in the comments box below. If you have any feedback, if you agree, disagree, or see things differently, please do share them as well so that we can have this fruitful discussion together and learn from each other. And Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before you leave, any last thoughts? Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the tie as well? Yeah, you can find us at thetie.io. We know our website doesn't really explain what we do. We're working on it. Um, <laughs> you also follow us on Twitter um, at thetie.io. Uh, the great thing is we have a really, you know, not to toot our own horn, but I, I do really like our newsletter. It's free every week. We have no ads. We've never actually tried to sell anything in it. Um, it's just our way of interacting with the community. Um, you can go to blog.thetie.io. You can actually click in on the last newsletter. It's blog.thetie.io, blog.thetie.io. Click on a new, click on the most recent newsletter. If you like it, there's a subscribe button at the bottom. Uh, but if you don't like it, don't subscribe, obviously. Um, and, and yeah, and you can also find me on Twitter, um, I think. My name is Joshua Frank. If you Google Joshua Frank the tie or you Twitter me, I think you can find me. Uh, I don't have that many followers, but if you want to be one of them, uh, you know, would appreciate the, the follow. <laughs> we'll put all the links in the description box below. Joshua, it's been an absolute blast having you on the show. You know, it's really important that we get access to all these data sets and, and metrics. And guys, if you like this content, if there's some data sets that you have found that really mean a lot in terms of understanding the crypto market asset class, don't forget to put it in the comments box below. Also, join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you so much, guys, and see you next week.